Today on Horsepower, Mike's in the shop performing carb surgery. And after this operation, a plain single inlet pumper turns into a tunable double inlet dynamo with surprising results in the dyno cell. Meanwhile, Joe's at the track to discover why these eight mile outlaws are turning to turbos and winning the war of the high performance power adders. Say, want to know how to get more out of the carburetor on your street motor? Simple. Just make sure it's a 1050 Dominator with a shot of nitrous. Nothing to it. That's great if you've got deep pockets or a full-blown race car, but a lot of us are looking for ways to improve our carbureted hot rod without emptying our wallets. So today, I'm going to show you how to transform a single inlet 600 CFM 4 barrel 4160 into a more tunable, better performing carburetor. Plus, it'll give you the visual image of a more race-oriented one. Now here's what you're going to need, and we got most of it from Holly. Two float bowls, two floats, hanger assemblies, needle and seats, a fuel line from Earl's, two jets, and a metering block kit. Now the easy thing are the tools needed. A flat blade screwdriver, 5 16 socket, an AN wrench, and preferably a jet tool. First thing we need to do is remove the primary and secondary float bowls, along with the fuel transfer tube. Older Hollies used paper gaskets that were a nightmare to remove. Now thank goodness they switched these new blue non-stick gaskets in later models that make it a breeze to disassemble. Next, we can remove the secondary metering plate. Now there's a special tool to remove these clutch head screws, which we don't have and I bet you don't either. So we just modified a flat blade screwdriver to get the job done. Now let me show you the difference between these two. The secondary metering plate has a fixed orifice which meters the secondary fuel. In order to change the orifice size, you have to replace the whole plate. Now the secondary metering block is similar to the primary block. All you have to do is swap out the jets to change the orifice size, which makes it a lot easier to tune. Now this is the smallest piece of the whole swap, and also the trickiest. Attaching the hangers to the floats can be a big pain. Let me show you why. You have to get this small spring positioned just right on the hanger and the float. Then slide the pin through the assembly, making sure the spring doesn't pop out of place. Now I did a lot of practice, but if you're lucky enough to get it on the first time, you better book a flight to Vegas. Next, we need to install the float assemblies into the float bowls, using the self-tapping screws provided. Now we can grease the o-ring and install the needle and seats followed by this one-way flapper valve in the primary bowl. Now in case you didn't bust me already, you also need a Phillips screwdriver to remove the accelerator pump cover, the diaphragm, and spring from the original bowl, and install them on the new primary bowl. Now we can adjust the float level by holding the bowl upside down and centering the float, which should be a good place to start. And with a new gasket, we can install the primary float bowl, making sure the accelerator pump arm and the lever are positioned correctly. Next, we can install the jets in the secondary metering block using a jet tool. Now to find out what jets you'll need, contact Holly's tech line. Followed by new gaskets and the secondary metering block, which does not have a power valve. Now we can attach the secondary float bowl, install the sight plugs, which allow you to set the float level once fuel is in the bowls. <laughs> and finish it off with an Earl's fuel line. Now these can be a pain to install unless you disassemble it. All right, well that's it for the carb upgrade. Now let's see if it'll feed this 383 stroker back on the engine dyno. Plus, we're gonna see if bigger is better when it comes to headers and even try out a carb spacer for more horsepower. It's dyno time for this 383 Chevy small block, and we're about to find out what effect our carb upgrades have on this motor's power. We started with a single feed 600 CFM 4160 Holly, then added float bowls, two hanger assemblies, two floats, a secondary metering block kit, needles and seats, two secondary jets, and a dual inlet fuel line.
running 93 octane for these tests, the upgraded 600 made 427 horsepower, 415 foot-pounds of torque. I don't like to float my own boat, but the upgrades on that carb seem to work very good. Now I know what you might be thinking, those are some pretty good numbers, but how much better is that carb than before the modifications? Well, we just happen to have another one sitting on the shelf, so we're going to find out. We made 421 horsepower, 408 foot-pounds of torque with the single feed 600. Now some of you may be wondering what would happen if we added a larger CFM carburetor. Well, we've got that covered too. A few weeks ago, we dynoed this same 383 to test some E3 spark plugs. That time with the Holley 770 Street Avenger, and we got 412 horsepower. All right, we used the same exact setup for all these tests. Now our upgraded 600 made the most power. So that goes to show you don't necessarily need more CFM to maximize your power. That's especially true with the vacuum secondary carburetor because if you don't need the extra air and fuel, the secondaries aren't gonna open all the way to begin with. We made all the runs using these inch and three quarter long tube headman headers. Since we made more power with a smaller carb, now I'm curious to see what happens to the horsepower and torque using a set of inch and 5 8 headers. With the inch and 5 8 headers, we made 414 horsepower, 402 foot-pounds of torque. That's a loss of 13 horsepower and 13 foot-pounds. Well, that goes to show you these dart heads like to move a little air. Now, we're going to get rid of the inch and 5 8 headers and go back to the inch and 3 quarter. Before we call it quits, there's one more thing I want to try. A spacer between the carburetor and the intake manifold can improve power and throttle response by improving their fuel mixture. The question is, which one works better? An open hole spacer or one with tapered holes? Well, we're going to find out. Both of these came from Transdapt, and the open hole which increases plenum volume is supposed to extend the power band. The idea behind the holes in this spacer is better fuel atomization, so you enjoy more torque and throttle response. We didn't see any gains using our spacer, and that's because we're running a high-rise intake with a one-inch built-in spacer. Now, if you're running a street manifold, you'll definitely see a benefit. Well, that's it for our carb upgrade and our dyno test. Now it's time to head down to Huntsville, meet up with Joe, and watch some of the fastest 10-5 racing in the country. Well, we're back, and now to pose the question, are turbochargers taking over the world of competitive high performance? Well, we've come to a drag strip where all three power adders are here to battle it out. Including big bad blowers. And of course, good old giggle gas, nitrous oxide. The event was the season opener of the year one Orska series where rain seemed destined to be the overall winner. Long delays left time for only one complete qualifying round and top qualifier in the fastest outlaw 10-5 class was a nitrous turned turbo guy from New Jersey. It just got to be too costly keeping it together. 
break a lot of parts and uh, we saw everybody going turbo and running fast, so we tried it. We've been there ever since. Joe's running a 540-inch Chevy Big Block with twin 91-millimeter turbos. A reliable and more cost-effective combination than he had during those Nitrous days. Initially, they probably cost more money to build back when this all started, but now with these big Nitrous motors, probably cheaper to build a turbo car from scratch nowadays and it's a lot more durable piece. Of course, whether for racing or daily driving, the concept's the same. Turbochargers are forced induction devices that use exhaust energy to cram more airflow into an engine. Exhaust flow from the headers drives the blades of a turbine wheel before it discharges. On the other side, an aluminum impeller wheel draws in and compresses fresh air. These wheels ride on a close tolerance shaft that can spin well over 100,000 RPMs. Race motor turbos can easily increase intake pressure by as much as 50 pounds. Well, you've heard of turbo lag before, the time it takes the process to make power. But for drag racing, lag is no drawback at all. If you get your converter right and you get up on boost, you're not going to have turbo lag at all. You see some cars go out there and leave lazy and the big power comes on later, but for the most part, you get the starting line boost right, you're good. I guess that guy should know he set the Outlaw 10-5 world records on both 8-mile and quarter-mile tracks. But I owe all that to the turbocharger. I mean, without a turbo, I don't know where we'd be. Tim also gives credit to this guy, Steve Petty from Proline Racing. He's not only Lynch's crew chief, he's got numerous cars here with motors he blueprinted for precision turbo power. I do all the combinations for the motors, like the camshafts, the compression ratios, rod lengths. I basically build the motor on paper. I just help them make sure they're in the groove, line them up, a lot of little things, make sure they turn their data loggers on. If they go out there and I'm not out there and they have a problem and the car does something stupid, it's best for me to be there and see what it's doing that way. When I get back to the pits, I know what the problem is and how to address it. Basically, at 1.5 seconds in the run, I had nine degrees of timing pulled out like a gear retard. Right there, where the converter locks up and wants to shake the tires, you time it, pull timing out right there and just kind of squeeze up the crap. There's a big learning curve, I guess, for a lot of guys with these uh, turbos. What, what's the biggest part of that? Driving it, staging, that's the toughest part. Really? Oh, yeah. It's got to have really good brakes, motor tune up's got to be spot on, motor healthy, and that's, that's really the, the worst thing. Once you let off the button, you know, pretty easy from there. I'm just a thoroughbred nitrous guy, man. I, I'm, I love the nitrous stuff. I've had engine builders try to convert me over to turbos, but I'm going to try to stick with the nitrous deal. And who could blame diehard nitrous guys like Mike Hill for hanging on to their squeeze box? Even in IHRA, you watch the nitrous cars kind of fell off for a minute, and then they, they make a rule change and bring them back. And I just think we got to kind of do the same thing, you know, adjust to where you keep parity and keep the nitrous cars coming. I mean, nobody wants to see a whole turbo field. Then again, no one wants to change the renegade essence of outlaw racing either, where racers can create their own unique power combinations, where they can run anything as long as they plant their power on the same tires as the next guy. For now, the turbo trend is a hot one, but hopefully you'll continue to see clouds of nitrous spray fill the night track air and still fill the ground shaking tremors of a blown alcohol burnout. It's all part of the heritage of Heads Up Racing. That's pretty cool. Now here's a way to make an explosive statement in your race car or off-road vehicle. It's Cherry Bomb's new glass pack muffler that's designed to bolt right up to the header for immediate power and torque. Now each one features a true straight through three inch core that's wrapped in high temp wrapping. Now they're available in four different sizes and ready to give you plenty of performance and loud sound. Now the price, well how does 95 bucks sound to you? Well next, technology's taken over everything from the way we operate our vehicles to the way we work on them, even degree in a camshaft. Now, for eons, the tried and proven way was the way that Buddy showed you a few weeks ago that starts with finding top dead center. First, to find top dead center, rotate the crank clockwise 10 degrees. Tighten the piston stop till it touches the top of the piston. Then rotate the crank clockwise until it hits the piston stop again. Mark the number, 
divide by two, and that's top dead center. Of course, then he goes on to show you the traditional way to degree it. Well, recently at a trade show, we picked up this gadget called a Digicam, and well, today we thought we'd give it a shot and see how this thing works. It uses these crankshaft inserts, and after you find the one that's right for your crank, you drop it in, tighten the set screw with an Allen wrench, then you can slide the Digicam device over the crank snout, and tighten it down with another set of screws. It also comes with a spacer that bolts right up to the block. That's good and snug. Now you still use the dial indicator like the traditional way, but no more degree wheel and this baby does all the math. Now to find TDC, you install the piston stop. Now turn the motor counterclockwise about 30 degrees and then you run your piston stop into a bottoms out on a piston. Now press the menu button until TDC shows up and press select. The display will prompt you to rotate the engine clockwise until you hit the piston stop. Now press the BTDC button and the display prompts you to rotate the engine counterclockwise until the piston hits the stop again. Now press the ATDC button to show the correct piston position. Rotate the piston away from the stop, remove the stop, and rotate the engine until the display shows 0.0, .0 which is top dead center. Now to degree in the cam, you rotate the engine to find max lift on the intake valve. Then zero your dial indicator. If the needle starts falling, it's because your hydraulic lifter is bleeding down. It will stop in a few seconds. Now rotate the engine counterclockwise to 100 thousandths before max lift. Press the menu button until the letters CCTR are displayed. Press select and the display prompts you to rotate the engine until 50 thousandths before max lift. Now press the BTDC button and this display will prompt you to rotate clockwise until 50 thousandths after max lift. Now press the ATDC button and the display will show you the cam intake center line. Okay buddy, as a guy who's now degreed cams the old traditional way and the digital way, what's your pick? Well, Joe, I'm accustomed to using a degree wheel, but I can see where this would come in really handy if the engine was still in the car. Very diplomatic, right? <laughs> By the way, this thing goes for about 300 bucks. These uh, inserts, well, they're sold separately. Well, that's going to put the wraps on this week's horsepower. Why don't you come join us next time?